if you need to like generate business fast, like it's intent, right? So it's like, where are the people already searching? Let's go find everything that, that are, what, who are our competitors and what are they doing on, on, on search? Like search is where the intent is. If we need to bring in capital, we need to bring in business fast. Let's go where people have the highest propensity to go forward. So correct search right away. That was like goal number one. Like let's, let's dominate search. Let's understand search. Let's, let's really, really hone in on that as, as one of our first channels to like really say that, Hey, check that channel off. It's like we have, we have our metrics pretty, pretty packed. We have a, we have a really good understanding of our, of our metrics here and we can, we, we have a good idea of how we can scale this. Welcome to another episode of the Hyper Growth Experience. I am your host, Nima Gardide. Today we have Cam Bodenstadt, the VP of Growth at Pipe on the podcast. If you don't know about Pipe, Pipe is a modern capital platform. They really provide companies and founders with non-dilutive capital to help them grow their companies without having to risk equity in their businesses, which I think is a wonderful service to provide to folks is a different source of capital for folks to grow. We have a few clients actually that I, I think use their product and they're pretty happy with, with the, the engagement there. It was really great to speak to him. You know, he's had a consumer background before doing this work, which is a lot more focused on acquiring businesses, but it's very clear that he had such a strong framework behind the way he's helped grow businesses. He's been a founder in the past and has also helped companies to scale. Uh, we dive deep into how he thinks about audience building and growing pipe and the trust he's had to build with the sales team and creating sort of standards for how to consider their work on the marketing and growth side a success. And we get into the, the data stack as well of how their, their teams work together. But we start with Cam's journey as an entrepreneur and the sort of non-traditional businesses he's been in before getting to Pipe. Here's Cam. I'm here from uh, Austin, Texas now, but I grew up in South Florida. And you know, I've been in, in kind of like the, the, the marketing world for the last you know, 10 to 12 years. And kind of mostly as like a founder, always just uh you know as i create businesses i always felt like you know the thing that i could add the most value to was the sales and marketing aspect so i you know, kind of fell in love with that and like being a non-technical founder so uh you know the sales and, and marketing was something that i could add a lot of value uh at all of my startups and just something i really uh I leaned into over the years well, what kind of companies have you sort of created or been a part of before i've been uh, i'm curious i think we we're going to talk about this in, in a bit but um, pipe is just a little bit new for you in terms of the type of company it is. So I wanted to give the audience some uh, context about the type of businesses you've started and um, scaled and sold in the past. Um, yeah, so it's, it's the full gamut. And I, I started like my first business was a, a windshield replacement business. <laughs> and I was like 18 and it was crushing it and you know, scaled it to multiple locations. And I was, you know, really, I always like, fell in love with entrepreneurship and kind of the whole uh, you know, m making my own schedule and, you know, my efforts were like directly reflected in my paycheck kind of thing. So it was like, I, I fell in love with that idea. And then I had a slew of failures. So it's, you know, always, <laughs> always starting some type of new business between, you know, uh, you name, you name it. I've tried to, I've tried to start it. And, uh, I, uh, you know, 2013, I started this, uh, with my co-founder, uh, his, his background was in, 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 is in manufacturing. So we, we started this, uh, this label business uh, for logistics, shipping labels, and, you know, took you know, years of, 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 of non-market uh, product market fit. And then in 2017, it hit and it was like, took off. And, you know, it went, uh, it was just shipping labels that, you know, you print them out and slap them on your, your, your econ in your business. And it, uh, it had the, the pack and slip and uh, the shipping label on one label. And, uh, you know, then it just scaled all across the EU. So we're in like, five or six countries in the EU and all of the United States. And that business was super fun. And I learned a ton about like a very non-traditional business and like all of the actual running a, 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 a like a, a real organization and uh, fell in love with crypto. And so like, the, I guess the transition <laughs> there is that like I, I, uh, yeah, I caught the bug in 2016 and the 2017 and uh, me and my friends were you know, kind of in all of the, the same crypto craze that everybody else was in 2017. And, 
uh, one of the things that we kept on, you know, figuring out which altcoin to go into, what to do. And uh, one of our other friends is like, you know, super uh, you know, analytical. He's like, hey, you know, like you could rebalance, you could do all these things. And he was doing it in spreadsheets for us. And my other friend was like, yo, let's just make this, let's make this a product. And we whipped it up and we ended up scaling it and selling it to uh, Shapeshift. And we all, we got actually hired and went to Shapeshift. And that's a big crypto exchange uh, for, we were there for, I was there for almost uh, two and a half years. And then uh, I just wanted to get back to entrepreneurship. So um, came back down to Austin. And was the head of growth with my my other friend at his uh, coffee business, uh, as and we scaled that throughout the pandemic, which was just like right time, right right place. And uh, then I saw what was happening at Pipe in late 2020, uh, 2021, and so I joined the beginning of 2021. I I started interviewing with Harry and Yaz in, in 2020, and then joined. I was uh, the first marketer at Pipe. So uh, now. We, Scaled the heck out of that business, and there I am with the team and all the things. So tell me about. So you went um, back into entrepreneurship briefly during COVID, um, and then cho- chose to work at Pipe and work on Pipe. Yeah. What was exciting about yeah. Pipe, and and can you give us like a maybe a snapshot of first of all what is Pipe, and uh, what was the state of the company when you joined it? Pipe allows you know founders to get non dilutive capital. Really simple. When I when I saw what Harry and Josh were doing, they were adding, they were allowing founders to sell their recurring revenues up front to take some capital. And so it's non dilutive capital. And so it's like a really founder friendly way of, of, of scaling your business. When I when I saw my friends, uh, I had two friends that were early on at at, at Pipe as well, uh, and I knew them from from like Austin's uh, like startup community. And I saw I knew them. Um, and I saw what they were building, and I was like, okay, I'm like, I, I get it. I get what you're doing. It's a marketplace. I'm coming from Shapeshift that's an exchange. I very much like the mission that you guys are trying to do. You're trying to help founders. So it's like checking all the boxes for me. It's technology. It's early. Um, they have a great brand. My friend, I have two friends there. Uh, I, I also, like the, the, the community that it serves is, my, is, the, is like right in mine. So I you know, just reach out to, to Harry and to, um, to Yaz, who's the CMO at, at Pipe. And I said, "Hey, like, I, I love it. Like, I, I don't know what you're doing for your, for a growth team, but uh, you know, here's my background. I would love love a shot to just talk to you. You know, we started talking, and it was like, you got to come on. That's so. started. That's exciting. Yeah. And so, uh, if I were to repeat that back to you, this is kind of like invoice factoring, but for SaaS. Yeah, I mean, that's where it was there. So it's, it's very much evolved. Right now, we, we've evolved it so much in the business, and it's continuous evolving. Right now." Any type of revenue that's repeatable or even re- that's we can predict it, and, and that's the currency. Things are always shifting, right? So, like the, the product is evolving uh, right now, even to a degree. And so, when I came on, it was very SaaS focused. Then we went into any type of revenues, and now it's just like it's very much like the, 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 definitely the product is evolving. Gotcha. So it's any form of predictable revenue to to some like error rate that you're okay with. You're, you're willing to sort of front. The company some capital uh, upfront for that predicted revenue outcome. Yeah, like walk us through the first couple of months. Like you were the first growth hire, but there was an already a CMO. How did you guys think about? No, she it was it was our V it was a VP of marketing, and she's like a wizard at at, at branding. Mm. And so like you know, I'm a very honest person when I first meet with people. Like I like to say like, hey, like where are my strengths and where are my weaknesses? And so I'm like, hey, I'm. Branding is not my thing. I'm a performance marketer. Mm-hmm. I think about the funnel. I care about metrics. I care about the stuff I think about. It's you know so in depth. But when it comes to like the brand itself, like if I have like it's like a yin and a yang. Like like a, like if I if if that's her superpower, this is my superpower. We're like that. We're, we're dominant this way. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I think uh, commonly people talk about how we can which one of these things could you bring in first into an organization. But it sounds like from an early on. There was both like a brand focus and a performance focus in the in the organization, which is probably good yeah. for a long term. Oh, definitely, and and just knowing each other's strengths. I mean, like that's like the biggest thing I think from from um, you know when you when you're building out your team, but also just like those those first players. It's like who who really like gets excited. Like, I wake up thinking about funnel metrics. Mm-hmm. I get you know like <laughs> performance stuff is like what I care about, right? And so uh, you know. I couldn't say that I wake up like, you know, how's the, you know, the brand, you know, like the brand, like I'm just very lucky that like she built a very dope brand. Yeah. That's, that's a, 
good position to be in because I, I find that a lot of the times, at least in uh, the performance world, which is sort of where I spend most of my time, there is this like um, maybe negative point of view on brand on the performance side where people yeah. are sort of yeah. like struggling against the folks on the branding side. Um, I generally disagree with that. And it's good to see that this, this it can be a very fruitful partnership between these two things. And um, I think people miss out on that um, because the, the, maybe Absolutely. the language is different and the pers their perspective is, are different around the same thing, which is both of these folks want to grow the company. And so that part seems and so it's clear. It's the common goal. It's like zoom out, man. Yeah. Just like zoom out a little bit. What's our what's our common goal here? Like, what are we trying to achieve? You're going to achieve it this way. I'm going to try it this way. I can help bolster it. The better brand you build makes my job mm -hmm. easier. Uh, you know, it, it's a vicious. It's like a circle. We can help, like you know. So to that story. So when you when you joined in, you were going to focus mostly sounds like on the performance side, on the on the funnel optimization side. Did you end up building a team immediately? Like, were you? pressing the buttons on these no. networks yourself. Like how was it yeah. going uh, for the first, like, and I know it, it all happened very fast. So <laughs> uh, I'd love to get maybe like yeah. a snapshot and then we can talk about the team. You, like it was, it was Jazz and I for, for almost a year mm -hmm. alone, just like us too. And, but I had contractors. So I was like, Hey, let's, let's not scale with headcount. Let's scale with like, let's use, let's go get a contractor for this. I can manage a contractor for this. I, I know how to pull the levers on these things. So I can like, get in there, help set up the account initially, and then have them scale the account or then. So that's kind of like the, the playbook that I, I, I the, the, overall the plays that we ran was get in there, set the accounts up, structure it the way that I want it structured, build out the process and say, Hey, contractor, let's, mm -hmm. let's do it this way. Report on this cadence. Uh, these are going to be the things that I'm going to be looking for every on a weekly, you know, reporting structure. And we did that for almost a year just with contractors. And is, was there sort of like an underlying framework for testing the different channels? Did you have like an intuition where, if, you know, X channel is just going to work yeah. or you're running tests yeah. out in the, in the market first? Like, how were you thinking about those early days? Oh, I, man, I think it's like, it's always where, where, where you, when you, if you need to like generate business fast, like it's intent, right? So it's like, where are the people already searching? Let's go find everything that, that are, what, who are our competitors and what are they doing on, on, on search? Like search is where the intent is. If we need to bring in capital, we need to bring in business fast. Let's go where people have the highest propensity to go forward. So correct search right away. That was like goal number one. Like let's, let's dominate search. Let's understand search. Let's, let's really, really hone in on that as, as one of our first channels to like really say that, Hey, check that channel off. It's like we have, we have our metrics pretty, pretty packed. We have a, we have a really good understanding of our, of our metrics here and we can, we, we have a good idea of how we can scale this. And once I got that one done, you know, it was like, let's, let's go to social, but social is a little bit different in B2B. And that's like where I, that was my learning curve. That was like where I got kind of punched in the face was that like, I, uh, didn't initially know, um, you know, I'm a D2C marketer. And so, uh, you know, moving into a B2B world and I like, I've never touched LinkedIn. I don't know anything about LinkedIn. Like that's like the last channel I've ever, now I'm like, you know, I know LinkedIn inside and out, but that was like kind of a goal. It was like, how do I, how do I learn LinkedIn? How do I scale LinkedIn? And it actually worked because it's just really high CP, really high sorry, cost for uh, impressions and the, uh, the cost to acquire a customer that is very high as well. So you, 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 you have to shift your mindset there a, a good amount. Yeah. And, and if I were to sort of repeat that back to you, the, the clear path to starting out is just going where there is an existing intent. And then after you sort of um, capture a good portion of that potential traffic, then you're start to going, going towards less intent based channels like LinkedIn or paid social in general. Um, well, and I, and I'll, I'll double down there. So, you know, I'll say that like, how, or I'll, I'll, I'll give you some insight. It's like, um, we could test very rapidly, very, like we could do a, a broad stroke of, of tests. Uh, and, and, and then throw in some type of survey, some type of, some things that we're gaining insights about the audience. And then we're also using like LinkedIn's like, um, you know, script to like kind of tell us who these people are. So I'm using traffic that I'm, I'm garnishing by, by the demand. I think that like my competitors are people who are already in the space or adjacent products that would be capital providing products. I'm, I'm getting their traffic to come in. And now I'm building these profile, I'm building these audience sets. Off of that, and I'm taking zero party data, and I'm also taking it from 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 the their, their different tracking scripts. So I'm I'm learning about these audiences 
at a rapid space. And I just think that like the easiest one that I could detect was was by search. So you're looking at the market and then sort of going down there. It just happened that search was the right sort of channel based on. I think search would always be if I came to a new business and there's like, it's like demand gen or, you know, lead gen kind of thing. It's like you're going to create demand with height. And then like legions, like where's the, where are they already going? Yeah. So if they're, if we know that, like, if I could just say, Hey, well, who, if I had to ask the founders, who are our competitors? And they say X, Y, and Z. And I say, okay, well, it's just like, let's go to all their landing pages. Let's go look at all their traffic. Let's go, let's go look at the ads they're running. Let's go look at the copy. Let's go look at everything. Let's go make it ours. Let's go look at the keywords. Like we'll just, we'll do all the things to, to reverse engineer exactly what's working in the current market. Now we're going to do stuff of our own on top, but I'm like, if they're spending a hundred thousand, two hundred thousand dollars a month on ads, either they're really bad marketers or they know what they're doing, mm-hmm. right? So, like, I'm going to hope that they know what they're doing, and I'm going to say, "Hey, like, I'm going to just learn off of them. They're going to take from their mistakes, and I'm going to say, if they're running it. It's probably good. Let's let's try to make that better." Yeah, there is always like the the signal of someone, a company spending that much money, usually is a good signal. I think it's very rare where companies are willing to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars per month on some channel when it's not working. Um, yeah, so that makes sense. So then uh, you were using contractors to sort of run these channels after you started introducing them. Um, were you upholding them to some, you said like a reporting cadence. Uh, I want to talk about cadence a little bit with you in general, uh, but were you also like enforcing some form of experimentational model? Like how are you managing these folks in the beginning uh, and, and trying to make sure that they're performing well because they're not in your organization and you're working with them remotely, I assume? Well, um, all of them, you know, everybody basically then had a clear path to like becoming on my team. So like basically <laughs> most of those marketers, like we, we built really good, like good, like working relationships, uh, as, as contractors. And now they're either they're full-time employees uh-huh. here. So it was like, it, it, so we built our processes were based off. Like I was, I already had it in mind that like when the time comes, these are the processes that we're going to be running as my, as my growth team. And so. Um, most of those processes are just the stuff that I would do on a regular basis. So I'm rather than maybe at the early days, not giving them the autonomy to say, I need you to think of these plays. I would say like, I'm going to come back and say, what are the big two rocks that I'm trying to move? What are the, what are the, all the levers that we can pull? And I'm going to say, Hey, I need these things done and not really giving a lot of autonomy, but giving very much just like, can you get these things done? Report back on this and, and it's very, very transactional, but it's just the opposite of where I am today. Right. Mm. So it's like a complete 180. It's like, Let's pick the one or two big rocks. You go come up with your ideas. Let's talk them out as a group. Let's let's you know, commit to them, and then let's all report and have like a you know a very very engaging but autonomous. Like my my team runs very very autonomous, like very much autonomously. Well, I feel like there is like a lot of wisdom in what you just mentioned, which is basically, and if I were to sort of like repeat that back to you, it's almost like you had at first you were exerting a lot of power. Um, and control to get things done faster because you have you were running on intuition you had all the data you had all the information um and then as the team grew and as as you've brought people into the company to work on this problem with you you're sort of like slowly letting go of that control and you're running the process uh, as opposed to uh just making all the sort of micro decisions uh, does that sound right yeah 100 yeah. yeah. percent. like it's a uh you know, in it, when it's transactional, it's transactional for me. It, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty blunt about it. It's like, I need this thing done very, very much so like this. And it has to be like this. But when you're on my team, like you're my teammate, like I, I don't dictate how you do it. We just have a common goal and our common goals are going to get met. And, you know, I mean, I'm here to help. I'm like, I'm just a, you know, yeah, I'm, I'm right in the trenches trying to get the same problems done. But when, yeah, very much the opposite side of like, me as a, as a, as a, with contractors and it's not a bad way. I just like, it's just the way I operate because I'm running really fast. And like, it's just, it's a very transactional agreement for me. It's like, we have to get these things done. If it's not up to par, then we can't move forward. And we're, we're not going to, you know, either we can you know try to fix it and, and go forward. But if it doesn't, I'm going to find the next contractor that can specifically do these tasks to the framework that I like to, uh, to operate under. Yeah. It's almost like you, you were sort of like extending your abilities with, by using sort of like a, an external set of contractors. It's like, Hey, I'm, I know exactly what I need to do. I just need it done. And I don't have the yes. hours in a day to do it. So I need you to help me with that. Later on, that yeah. is not the problem you're solving. You're solving for 
literally just coming up with the solutions themselves. So that's where your teammates come into. Yeah. It's like, hey, I don't actually know the solution. Supporting them. Uh, help me yeah. come up Supporting with Supporting them, giving them guidance, or even just saying, hey, like, here's some, here's a blind spot. Maybe I'm seeing that you're not, but like, how about we look at it both together? Mm. I, it's, I'm a completely different management style. Um, and and it, it's 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 a 180 world, like for, for those two. Yeah, and it makes a lot um, of sense to me, I think, like, especially in the early days of the company, um, you know, I, I'm a big fan of like, and, and I don't want to go on this tangent because it's in its own, like, I think it's one of those, this is another podcast thing, but I'm a big fan of organization design. And when people come to me and say, oh, I like to run sort of like a non-hierarchical organization that's sort of like, you know, helicratic is what's maybe what they're calling it these days. As like a principled way, it makes no sense to me. I think in a specific scenario, those things make sense. In other scenarios, they do not make sense. So it's almost as if like, just going back to your story, you were applying a management style for the problem at hand. And at the problem, yes. the problem it had at the time required a lot of sort of like control and more more of a transactional relationship. Later on, it just the nature of the problem shifted, so the solution for how to manage the people on the team would have changed, right? And, and that's like you know, I think the last thing you know, I spoke to you the other day, it was like you know, frameworks and playbooks, like playbooks to me, like and all, and like this whole idea that it's like I I struggle with this because like I, they evolve, like I can't necessarily ap apply one thing to a, any, any given time. It's like, it's like such a, you know, it's such a fluid, these problems are super fluid. And so at times you have to just like change it up and see if it works. Mm -hmm. Like today, this works. I have a, I have a really well-functioning team that like we really enjoy and not probably, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> I hope they love it. No, I'm just kidding. No, I'm kidding. No, no. Um, they, uh, we have a really, we have a great, it's like, you know, a really great relationship. And it's, I think it's like, you know, just a lot of listening, a lot of understanding where people are, where they want to go with, and uh, ultimately just putting trust in people's abilities. And um, we're going to mess stuff up. It's gonna, we're going to, you know, we're going to send the wrong emails to people. We're going to run the wrong ads. You know, like all these things are going to happen, dude, but like, it's not that big of a deal. And as long as we learn from our mistakes, make a process to like shore that up, then like, I don't ever, I don't ever trip about like things we mess up. Mm. My boss doesn't do either. Like, I think, one of the the first days and this is like one of the earlier just me and i'm like sent out this massive email and i was like yes yeah, i sent that email to the wrong people i was pretty i was pretty like hurt like i just got like punched in the stomach kind of thing because i like you know i you know you hate when you make a mistake like email is one of those things like when you press it it's gone like you know <laughs> yeah, what i mean like and i was like i was like i was, I was like i was like hey yes yeah, uh, i think i sent this to the wrong cohort of people uh you know i, I put these filters in but the you know the segment didn't come up correct we like diagnosed it. Like, oh, not a big deal. I was like, not a big deal. She's like, no. I was like, all right, this is what I'm talking about. You know what I mean? Like, this is what I'm talking about. Like, I, I, I love it. So I kind of approach things the same way. It's like, if it's, if it's not of order of magnitude or bad, then like, well, it's not a trip. Let's just, let's just let's try not to do it again and go at it again. So yeah, that, oh man, I feel like, um, I feel for you. I, I've done, I've done exactly that before and it feels awful when you message the wrong people in like some campaign. Yes. <laughs> Um, yeah. And, and just, you can't go back. Yeah. Like, you know, <laughs> we in paid, you just like, maybe like it'll kill the ad, like kill the campaign, whatever it is. Like it's not a big deal, but email, it's just like, oh, yeah. no thousands backs. of people got it. <laughs> it has the wrong content and it makes Maybe. no sense. It's just so bad. Yeah. Um, okay, yeah. So going to this frameworks versus playbooks, um, sort of discussion and for context, you know, we've been just talking about this concept since we were decided to do the podcast around. So, you know, people come and, and say, I have a playbook for like scaling you up on X and, and I'm going to apply it sort of like a lot of marketers think in this way. Uh, to me, that, that doesn't make sense. And I think you just alluded that it doesn't make sense to you. But just going into your mind camp, like what are the frameworks they use? What are the processes that um, are currently working for you and that you feel that you're going to carry with you every time uh, when you go and start another business or, or work on a new product or, or try to scale up an existing product? What are the things that you hold dear as processes that you sort of like commit to as opposed to a, a playbook um, to maybe okay. do X or Y? Yeah. And maybe I just don't articulate it correctly. You know, maybe that's my issues. Like maybe I don't, I don't formulate the idea of what my playbook or my framework is. Maybe I, I probably have them. You probably have them. We probably use them in some case, but I, I, I think that like, I have no tried and true thing that like, I, I think I, I approach a lot of these problems. Every industry is different. Every every business is different. Every quarter sometimes is different, man. Like if TikTok wasn't here or ChatGPT wasn't here, like you approach things differently. So I think like just having like a like a 
an open mindset that you that ultimately I'm gonna I'm gonna look at what drives this business revenue, what makes whatever thing makes money, and that in there's there's LTV, there's like the lifetime value side of, of 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 our job that we need to really push into, or the the acquisition side that we need to drive down those costs, and so those play very hand in hand with each other. And I so I but that framework I guess I always use is that like how do I increase the lifetime value of customers? There's a slew of tactics there, right? For the business. And on the other side of the equation, how do we drive down the costs at the blended level or the channel level? Both of those play into each other and lifetime value in itself, there that comes with retention, growth. There's like op, there's ops that the part of that to like actually drive down your gross margin or whatever, like to drive up your gross margins. Whatever you can do to increase that bucket decrease this bucket mm. and play that like that's you no know, like in business we're here to make money we're here to serve but the business is here to make like thrive and make money and so if that's the case that money gets generated at the life the value of the lifetime of that customer so whatever those things are and so like my frameworks are pretty simple like the way i think about things let's understand the ltv or let's understand the lifetime value and let's understand the cac blended and at the channel level or paid channel and from there we can go to work mm-hmm. and I, I don't know if that. I mean, like, that's actually very good. Correctly. You know, that <laughs> I don't think like uh, you need to have a name for it. Um, you know, the way I've thought about this is kind of there is like a formula for growing the company, and then your job is to sort of optimize that formula. And so your formula in this case is very clear. There is like a cost to acquire new 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 folks into this business, and then there's a uh, quality and service quality thing that increases how long they are going to use this service. And so your job is to sort of optimize those things, one to lower, one to, to go higher. And, and the ultimate thing is that the business ends up making more money um, and, and has more propensity to grow because of that. Um, in the early days when you joined, was there a very clear understanding of LTV? Like, how did you operate in that? Like, no, it's a tough one. Yeah, like how do you marketplaces in itself, or like where we were, you know, we were a market, we were a marketplace. Those are really tough. Like marketplace understanding, like lifetime value, tough. We're early on, very tough. So you, you have to just make. Like, I can't control that one yet. Yeah. I have no idea, right? Like that one has to. You're early on. We're like one year old, like you know, just over a year old. There's not necessarily a lot of of data like historically you can have some projections or some forecasting that you could say if this thing were to repeat itself here you know chances are why uh but what can i control and in a b2b i can control the, the cost of a lead cost of it uh, you know, of a marketing qualified lead and the cost of an, uh, an sqo or a sales qualified lead and that's like and then everything a bit and when i say like lead just give me your email give me something about you and then there's all types of plays that we can run to get people to MQLs, decipher whether they're actually marketing qualified leads, and then move them up the ladder into an SQL or a sales qualified lead. That is like the thing I have to hone in and be laser focused early on in this business and just like crush that, understand these metrics really well. And what is it? And then their propensity to go down funnel. And like some of that stuff, especially in like a B2B business or like in a sat, like a business like our, this B2B business, like I don't have a lot of control at the product level. So like, you're really having to try to paint with data like, hey, these leads are of X quality because of these indicators. These indicators we define have, you know, the, the, the likelihood to go down all the way down the funnel, you know, at, at this percentage. And so we're goal was to try to make a sales qualified lead and try to get to a threshold and try to nail that. And then all the all the steps to get people up the ladder to there. And that was like kind of the, the focus for the you know, the first, you know, a year, almost 18 months is like, be, be ruthless. Mm. There. And were you sort of working with the sales staff there or are you going on the calls yeah. to understand like how, what are some of the like in, in, early qualifying metrics or data that you were looking Man. at? So this is like, I, you know, I think that you and I talked about like a DTC marketer. That's the stuff I really know. DTC subscriptions mm-hmm. specific is what I understand the best. And, uh, you know whether you have like a sale pretty quick, right? You know if you're gonna get this, and then you have like you have like this this date that you generally have like high high churn at this date, and then from there you have like you have these just different tranches, these different cohorts that like that's where the churn is. Like you try to do these, you have all these different plays to try to like reduce churn here, 
which increases LTV. You know, it's like you do all these things. And so, but you, you have a really good idea early on, like, do you got a win or not? This campaign going to work or not? And with B2B sales for a marketplace like this and, and for finance specifically, it's like, wow, man, like you were, you were talking like lead times that I've never even thought of. I've never <laughs> even thought of lead times like this. Like I, I was like, wait, what? You know? So, um, you want to find things like zero party data. You want to do like, you want to make correlations to zero party data, campaigns, keywords, like what kind of keywords they were looking mm. for and see whether those keywords have higher propensities to get approved or to go down funnel and use and use the product. And so then you're starting making just note, making mental notes here and there, all these things where you're saying, Hey, th- th- these type of keywords, well, like, let's go max bid it. Let's go, let's go push heavy on those keywords be, or let's go actually really, you know, uh, try to scale that one higher or let's go pay much more for these type of leads because they just have a higher uh, uh, likelihood of, of, of getting approved or going down funnel. Um, and I guess to, to, so, sorry, so to answer your question, it's zero party data was like, mm. what were, what were the questions that they asked? What was like on the onboarding flow? What could you ask them that would seem very much insightful for them because we need to know it, but also it's like, okay, people who say this, this, and this are likely to, yeah, like, yeah, rank them higher, rank them higher. And then just really, really be fine tuning that and, and try to send as much traffic and these things and get as much data. And then work with the sales team every week, you know, Hey, these leads, what were they like? I have a hunch on these leads. What were they like? You know, and just getting all that, their feedback loop was super tight. So feedback loops are something I'm really into, but on the design, on the content, on the sales, like I, I work closely with these different departments to, so that, that like I'm showing the creative to, to, to my, to the designers, this, this kind of stuff. These, this is where the performance is on these assets. So we can, we can talk about that one in a minute, but. So this, wow. like, yeah, I think I want to, I want to maybe spend a, 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 some time on this qualification part because at least in B two B, I see it working very well as well. So uh, the flow, I assume, and and please correct me if I'm wrong. If someone clicks on an ad, let's say off of search, they land on your landing page, and then they start going through some form of like a qualification process. So they're really answering questions yeah. that you that you can use when they arrive into your product. So it's be both useful to them to fill it out and that information is useful to you because you can then qualify if they're going to be a good user or not. Yeah. How, so first of all, like, I'd love to know what tooling you used for that. Are you, is that all built in house? And the, it's built. You built it it's built. Yeah. So I have two, like two engineers. I'm like, my growth team has two engineers. So we're, you know, we build everything, everything, you know, like the key thing and people have to like, can you have, you have, you know, I have two engineers that, are, that were, you know, uh, not even on the end or they're literally just on, on the growth nice. team. And it's like, yeah, I'm like, I'm, I have, uh, you know, a copy, we have a copy content person. We have a paid, we have a designer, we have a, an email and PMM. And so like, but two engineers, it's like, we, we will, we solve problems fast. Like yeah. that's, that's our like thing. It's like, we move fast because the worst thing is like, you're, when you're resource restricted and like, you're like, you're, 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 you're scratching for resources. Like, Hey, can we build this? We have these ideas. Like we need to be like on the opposite. We need to have like just as much firepower and we have a contractor on the outside, right? And just build pages. So yeah, it's I like, love it. dude. Yeah. That's super important. Yeah. We, there, we use like uh, a tool called form sort. That's rather new helps with this type of stuff, but it's very uh, important to, I think to have the velocity there for, for testing these flows. Um, and then, when people go through this flow, do you reject them ever? Where you're just like, you're not the right potential user for us. What do you do? I, I'm not here. I'm not here to tell people they're not qualified. Let the let the the ratings engine and let the thing do its job. I'm just here to try to gather some information and possibly send them down the right path. So, uh, you know, we we exploring different products in the past. We were, you know, they it made sense. Like, hey, maybe we put them down that path. Maybe we put them on this path. Maybe it was like a traffic controller, but definitely not like a red light or a, like a dead end side. It was just not, it didn't make sense to do it. And um, also people lie on forms. Like, I think it goes both <laughs> ways. And, and I, and I stress test this as well. Like I, I, we, we looked at like, okay, people said they had X amount of revenue. And then we, when you plug, when you come in the pipe, you connect your revenue sources that we actually see it. And we said, Hey, what, what was like the, what was the, the, this, the hit rate? What was the, the, how, how often were they lying? And it was like, man, like 70% of the time people tell the truth. Like people just tell the truth because like, if, I guess like if you're going to buy a house or a car and your bank said, Hey, how much do you make? You're not going to say I make $4 million or whatever. You're not going to, you're, you're going to say whatever you, you, yeah. you might say like 10% more. You might say a little bit more, but say you get the better, you know, like you high, juice your chances, but you're not going to leave like wildly off. Yeah. And that was like the, the conclusion that I landed on. I was like, 
self-reported data, maybe it's not 100% because you can't take it to the bank, but you can at least use that as a leading indicator on whether this is going to be a good lead or a bad lead. Yeah, and it goes back to like looking at all of this data that's coming in, almost like this this survey data, the, the um, quality of that cohort of leads, all of these are like leading indicators towards how the machine is working. And then you can use it to sort of like modify and modify and modify to, to make it better. Just think about that. Think about if I didn't, just imagine if you didn't have a feedback loop to, to your media buyer. If you had to work 90 days to figure out whether like, you were like, dude, you and like, I spent, we spent some money. Like we were, we were spending, like you probably sell our ads, you know, yeah. like we were spending some money. And like, if you don't, if you don't put a control on that, you can, you can get bad leads really quickly and you can lose the confidence of your sales team. My sales teams, they love us. They think that like we, we were a strongly inbound, you know, business by the, by on the, on the, on, on the work that we did at the growth team. And I would say that like we worked hand in glove with them. Because we listened to the feedback. If they saw low, lower quality leads and we were seeing that as well, then like we'd kill those mm-hmm. campaigns. There's, there's leads that we could get super cheap, like SQL numbers or sales qualified lead. Like we had like a goal, like, hey, let's hit this many every month. But like on, on caveat to that is it can't go below this number on the threshold of quality. Mm-hmm. And how do we define quality? Well, the sales team and the, and the growth team said, this is what quality is. And these are the indicators that go into it. We use, you know, we would then say, hey, like our, our threshold has to be above 60 to 70% of the, the, the leads that come in have to be above this quality. And so like we can't just run up the scoreboard on, on SQLs or, you know, the sales qualified leads from a channel that's sending like crappy leads. Like that doesn't work. So I really like this threshold idea because it almost builds this trust with the, with the sales team of like, hey, we don't want to be like ruining your days because it's, it's actually quite demoralizing for a salesperson to go on a call with some uh, someone that's just not the right fit for what they're selling. Um, I really like that as like a tool to uh, build a better relationship with with uh, with folks that you're working with. There. Yeah, um, and we and we we work like man. It's there's like you know even the like having dispositions, like having them the sales team disposition. You know, we use HubSpot and uh, having them disposition right into the into if they get off the sales call and they don't like it was it a fit or whatever it is, this position and, 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 and have these pre drop downs and have them select it. And then we're like looking at it and say, okay, which, which campaigns are sending this tons of these? Okay. Like why? Let's go figure that out. Okay. And then it was like, that, that was like kind of our, our game was just like find the areas of weakness and eliminate that, find the areas that are working and go pay more for it. Mm. You know, it's like, yeah, yeah. you know, the, it, eventually it's like, because if you spend money on bad leads, like ultimately, it doesn't matter if I pay five hundred dollars. Oh, I'm just making up numbers. If I pay a thousand dollars a lead or five hundred dollars a lead, if it like if I got a bunch of leads in and like only a small like it all matters like how far if it goes down to like them actually making us money. And so, don't well, let's try not to get super caught up on the number up here. Let's always try to decrease it. But quality has to be the indicator mm-hmm. of like our success. Yeah, I would far rather get a thousand dollar lead if the propensity of them to buy is like eighty percent versus. A hundred dollar lead that's yeah. like ten yeah. percent likely to convert, right? Um, yeah. You know, you mentioned HubSpot, I, I, and I assume you're somewhat opinionated about the tooling that you all use. Like, what is the stack that you you have, and and for tracking and and for making some of these decisions? Like, would you use the same stack if you started from scratch? Like, what have you learned in that process? When I got here, we didn't have a CRM. Mm-hmm. There was no CRM. It was like all spreadsheets. So we were really early on, <laughs> yeah. and so. Not that I'm like a HubSpot fan or I was like super like keen on using HubSpot. I actually was like, I don't know if you remember autopilot uh, mm-hmm. as a, as an email provider. Like that was like, yeah, you know, I'm like a Clavio autopilot nice. kind of guy. Yeah. But I, uh, from a tracking standpoint or from like a reporting, we use amplitude and segment. So everything is done with segment events. Everything that we track both on the front and the back end and downstream into the product is all done with segment events. So we have, you know, my team does a really good job of, you know, every, everything we build, you know, we definitely put into our build plans. Like, Hey, we want these things tracked. We want this thing done. And in our, you know, our, our inch, when they are reviewing like the, you know, the, the, you know, the spec, they're like, okay, I'm going to write these events. And then data science says, okay, yeah, I could definitely, you know, we can definitely look at it that way. And then everything gets put into amplitude and every, we just, we track things in amplitude Yeah. or preset. Like we have like all another product, like product suite that like the company uses, but my team um, uses amplitude a lot. Yeah, I'm a big fan of that tool. It seems to be very good. I, I just had someone on the pot um, who's a growth engineer for almost a decade. Um, 
and he recommends that exact stack. So I feel like you've picked pretty well <laughs> um, on segment being the core, routing everything, and then sort of amplitude being a good layer of uh, tracking on top of it, and then still building even further based on the raw data on segment um, and, and, and sort of building dashboards and, and tooling on top of the raw data eventually seems to yeah. be like the sort of modern stack these days. Yeah. You know, in, in like my whole team, I mean, I would say from everyone on my, we have, you know, the composition of my team is, you know, we have like a technical SEO content, um, you know, page channel, email PMM, growth engineers and designers. And, and I would say that like, other than the designers, every single person is like very, very, very proficient, like in, in, in amplitude, like it's, there's no, like, there's no lag. It's like everything, every question they, they generally answer their own questions. They have like, you know, they come up with their own hypothesis. Now we do have a, like a full data science department and, you know, one of the data, uh, the data teammates comes, uh, into all of our growth, growth, growth calls and is kind of like a satellite honorary member of our team. And he, uh, he, he then goes kind of a little bit more, um, deeper when we need things. So he'll, uh, He'll do the analysis and it just really like sanity check. Like that's the idea that like he brings so much value by this sanity checking, making sure there's enough exposures to like actually make it a justifiable where we can get South Sig or we can actually like make heads or tails. And then there's some things that like there's like second order effects. There's things that like you do things here, but and they might metrics might look really good and we're all high fiving, but in, like downstream it had a, like an adverse effect and making sure that like someone isn't just super happy about like the thing that they were trying to push. And so it's like having him say, Hey, full scope is there. Like I'm, I'm, a, I'm very unbiased here. I'm going to look at the whole thing and say, yes, you are winning here, but you're causing this. And so maybe we need to like put the whole thing into, into the equation. And that's, that's something like, I think it is really nice not having like a, a data team and someone that comes in that's super passionate about well, what, what the growth team is doing. Uh, you know, there is one person on your team that I'm very curious um, about which is the the PMM the product marketing manager I assume is what that stands for. Uh, yes. That is I would say rare to see on a growth team. So I, I, I'm curious how you think about that role, why and when you you, you hired for it, um, and what the value is uh, right now at in your organization with that, with that, someone with that mindset. Wow. So you would you would deem a the the product marketing function not on a growth team normally? I see it all, a lot on a marketing team more than a growth team and quite often growth and marketing teams are separated in companies I'm speaking to. Got yeah. it. Got it. Okay. So, um, yeah, it's a good distinction. I, I would say that, uh, so she is a, uh, super analytical, super like in the weeds on like, like helping the product, the product team, um, very much the, like she, she, full, she fulfills a true product marketing, uh, function. But I would say that like her, her true superpowers is very, very analytical mm. and like helps with the funnel as well. And so like why she sits on, on, on our team, um, is, is like so much of the funnel can be in, improved at the email level and at the, mar at the product marketing level itself, like product marketing on, in, in channels like email and out in externally in other ways or inside the app itself can help drive the LTV, which then drives down the tag. Mm. You, know, you know, like overall, like it is a direct correlation to the funnel that we can, we can improve on. And so like having someone that's like very analytical and very thinking about um, how to, how to, how to bolster up those numbers or you know, decrease those numbers, she has the power to do it. Like email might be one of the, you know, as you know, as a D to C market, it's like, the, it's, it's like the Holy grail sometimes SMS and, and email is the Holy grail. Mm -hmm. So, Having someone that like lives and breathes the product and being able to like just flow right into a channel so that she is both, both of them, the ER email marketer and our PMM. Oh, interesting. So it's almost like a composite role of lifecycle marketing plus product marketing. Um, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. With that lens of product marketing, you can probably do a better job at even, uh, you know, the core lifecycle marketing work that you do I, I like that a lot so so they're, they're are they like uh looking at ltv as a metric like that one seems to be harder to predict in general so how are you thinking about um this part and we can maybe shift further we just we just ha addressed acquisition let's shift to ltv and, and you know, increasing retention like how are you thinking about that it's, i would say it's like a little squishy for for it's a pipe it's much more squishy and like you know, I don't know if there's a true rhyme or reason. Like in D2C, there's a rhyme and reason on like 
when I do these things, I can like directly show it. But I like having things to get people to do to, to come into pipe and trade more often. And is it because of is it because of the email that was sent? Or is it because of the you know what what segmentation? Where where there may be a maybe a correlation, maybe not. I, I'll be like I can't say for like certain. Now I can say that we watch the tracks and we say, hey, like that person did open, you know, a Saturday email and they did on Monday make a trade. And maybe we could say that like that was the direct correlation. But ultimately, sometimes it's a really harder, it's harder specifically in, in this world because when I ran a growth team at a like a, at a really fast uh, e-com business, I had an LTV team and I had an acquisition team. And like that was we were all like, you know, very hand in glove with each other, but like the plays that we ran on the LTV side there. Uh, I, I knew the impact. I knew the impact that we could have. And I knew, you know, so it's like here, um, we definitely assume that these things are moving it. I think that ultimately they're not hurting it. They're not hurting, <laughs> they're not hurting the LTV, but they're, it's harder to like to decipher whether it's like, because it's capital, right? It's like when I need capital is um, when, when, a, when a founder needs capital or a business owner needs capital, probably is not going to be like super, uh, like it might have been like this thing that reminded them, like, oh, Pipe does that, you know. I, but I don't know if it was like they saw and they were like, I gotta go do this. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I gotta go do it. Like, you know, like it's just like a week, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go get a hundred. Yeah. Like, yeah, I need 200,000. Like, you know, like it's like things, you know, it's like it's staying on top of the mind, showing them how easy it is. I mean, Pipe is an aha moment. And like, yeah, I love products that have an aha moment. And one of the things is like when people put in all their, their, their systems and, and they would get rated and they, they have an approval or whatever, you know, there's, and you know, or when they want to, when they would like to, uh, when a buyer wants to buy, they like slide this thing over the contract. So they press a button and it's just like, whoa, like it just works. Like money's coming to my bank account right now. I just like, it's like an aha moment. And I think that that's really cool. Yeah, that's awesome. I, we have a couple of, uh, I think I, I told you this offline. We have a couple of customers uh, of yours as clients and they're big fans. Very cool. Yeah. Um, Very cool. Yeah, that's interesting. And I think that's a, a, a problem in probably a lot of like B2B where the decisions are being made outside of your um, prerogative as a marketer, right? And, and so increasing LTV is going to be harder. Maybe there's some product work, but in your type of business, the product is almost like the capital. And so it's much harder to really do anything there. Um, so it makes sense that you're thinking in correlations at best. Yeah, make it easy. Make it make it something like I think what the ads did really well was like they pipe a verb. Like pipe people say I'm gonna pipe it. Like you know, like pipe became a verb. It was very like perfect timing. Um and I I would I, I think that uh as as long as we can continue having like a strong brand, keep into like what what got us super like you know in front of a lot of these people and 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 not being like I think people just want to use pipe because it's a it's non dilutive capital, but also it's like it you know it's it's, it's capital in some ways is a commodity, but if you got it from pipe, it's cool. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like you know, it's like that's the you know, like that's that's pretty cool. I think you know, so yeah, um, and I think like plenty of capital providers have sort of leaned in on becoming a brand such that the value of the capital is perceived to be more than just the cash itself. Uh, so it makes a lot of strategic sense to have really pushed hard on that lever. Um, you know, I, I want to talk a bit about just the market shifting and how maybe that has changed your perspective as a growth person. Um, you know, the last maybe eight months or so, tech has gone through its own version of a recession. Maybe the general economy is going to go through a recession. Um, has that changed your perspective perspective on things? Are you are you still like just looking at the numbers and, and and focusing on where they take you? Are you thinking forward in that way at all? Looking at the macro markets, yeah. like how do you think about these things? I mean, I'd say like it's like kind of four dimensional chess here at Pipe because you know we lend to startups. You know, we we will not lend, but we 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 provide capital to to, to startups and. Ultimately, it's a risk model. People have to assess risk. So there are like very much a, an idea that you have to find. We, we need to be a little bit more focused on the type of leads that we want. And so working with the, you know, the risk team and say, Hey, like this is the type of leads that we want. The sales team wants to sell, right? They, 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 mm -hmm. they, they're here to sell stuff. So like quality leads is one thing, right? Risk is like, 
this type of box. You know what I'm saying? It's just like kind of like a little bit of a shift, not maybe because I want to shift things, but maybe like, you know, hey, the business wants to, it's, it's, like, we're, we're looking at assets, making sure that they, they, they're going to perform well. And then we're passing those over to, to a buyer. But if those things don't perform well, then that doesn't make a happy buyer. So it would be not, it would behoove us to do a really good job at the risk level to ensure that we give good cap, we give good products over to them. So we have to like, you know, really take those factors. That's why I say it's like four dimensional chess. So yes, we are a lot, a, lot, a little bit more, uh, uh, yeah, just a little bit more strategic in these times. Yeah. So your definition of risk has maybe shifted slightly or to some extent, um, which makes sense. So that that is actually kind of like a somewhat of a clear uh, directive to use when you're marketing out there. You're like, okay, well, I not only do I care about quality, but they also have to match this risk profile. So it's just another sort of like factor to judge the traffic that's coming in or the people that are coming in to to uh, re- use like, the product. It's a challenge accepted. You yeah, know? <laughs> that's like you know, it's like it's another challenge, right? Like it's like. I didn't foresee this, mm-hmm. but you know, ultimately, you always have to be looking like, at the type of risk that you're bringing in for the product. Uh, but it wasn't like at the, you know, today. I'm very much thinking about these things. Um, you know, I, I think that just as much as like the macro shift as a from a, I, I, and maybe this one where you're taking it, but I think just as much as the macro has had to make marketers think differently. I think that you know, Chat GPT has made marketers have to think a lot mm-hmm. differently, and I think that it has a it's maybe even a more of an impact. Like right now and in the future, like like the macro is gonna like macro is gonna do its thing, right? Like we might do a recession, we might not do a recession. I I, I don't know, but what, what I can't tell you is here is that like like how how we produce content, how we how we do our job, how we do everything is shifting like right now mm-hmm. and for the future. Yeah, so th- that's so, exactly where I was going to go next. Is I'm curious how you're already thinking about using. Um, AI, but specifically maybe chat GPT into the workflows of your team. Is there like a use case that's already On working? Everything. What's, yeah. what's been interesting? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> T- tell me more. <laughs> oh man, just, uh, I mean, you know, I do have two growth engineers. Mm-hmm. So that's like the, you know, like all of us are super into data. All of us are into like cutting edge. Like all, okay. Also majority of the, uh, my team comes from crypto as mm-hmm. well. So majority of the people I've worked with in the past, either at crypto exchanges, they came from a different crypto exchange. So they were already on like the the deep end of tech, right? So everybody on my team has like a pretty good composition of like like tech nerds, right? Yeah. So then we're all like very much like what the change, what whatever here is here. And so I mean, you know, all types, man, I I I I promise you like everything that we work on, it probably now has some element of we're running it through uh, you know, like our 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 engine, like hey, yeah, like let, let's just you know, ping the open AI uh, API. We'll do it this way. Like he's he's always building. Like I mean, talk about like taking Lighthouse data. So let's take FAQ data. Let's do all these little things and like let's let's rebro- like let's let's completely build out like robust like FAQs with this thing. He's like it's always something. We're always shifting mm-hmm. things around and like rebuilding things now and like building at speed that like I'm just like, man, it's 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 gonna be hard for for people to keep up with. Uh, with uh, like you know the the sheer amount of content that you're, if you if you leverage it correctly you can just like really hit the gas I think and that's probably what I'm looking forward to. Yeah, I, I would love to maybe like have you speculate a little bit. Like, let's work, go forward five years, assuming these things will like improve to some extent. Like, yeah. where do you see like how, no do way. you feel like you're gonna have one marketer doing everything? Do you feel like we we're gonna have a job in, in ten years? Like. Uh, where, where is this going? Yeah, anymore? man, I, I'm, I, I don't know. I mean, like, yeah, I mean, shoot. I, I couldn't even, couldn't even, I honestly speculate that far out, but I think that, uh, I mean, the jobs will just be different. Mm-hmm. It will be just different. It'll be, it, you know, if you, if you are like stuck and like, I can't use this, then like, you're probably in trouble, right? But if you say like, 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 the screwdriver is still here, but I have an electric drill, right? Like I, I have both type of drills. One's good for one thing, but like my electric drill probably, oh, this is really weird. <laughs> Let's not use that analogy. <laughs> I'm just, I, mean, I was like, I don't know where I'm going with that one. Oh, I, I guess like if you just do, uh, if you, you just figure out how to leverage this technology, then you're going to be pretty good for the short term. Now, long term, like it's unclear. your guess is as good as my guess. Yeah. It's very unclear, but I, I already see like, it's like, hey, marketers might be thinking, hey, I can, I can take this, thing and make a bunch of content, right? Well, that's like, like every marketer is thinking that, right? Like that's, that's not unique. Like, how can I get my, more, how can I get my team to think about 
okay, well, we can get all of these things, but each one of these things can have like a different element to it, a different, let's, let's like use this as like the 90% and then the 10% is where we're going to put like this human element. We're going to shine really, really heavy on it. And we're going to make something that like AI can't, well, it could probably replicate, but it doesn't come replicated out of the box. Like we're going to stitch a few things together. And like that, I believe is like the, the edge for the next, you know, at least a quarter or two is that like, Everyone is going this way. Let's go like a little bit over to this way, but we're going to be using the same technology. We're just going to do something a little bit differently with it. And that's like how I'm, I'm thinking about this and building tools to help other people utilize this thing is I think another big play. Yeah. And it, I think I'm, I'm with you. You know, I, I think of it as at least for now, a tool to leverage your existing abilities um, and make it maybe, you know, X percent faster. Um, I, I still program because we ha we have a SaaS product that we um, are about to launch, and it's kind of my like side job as we're running the agency at the same time. And yeah, I'm just I'm maybe twenty percent faster very easily. I can say that uh, by using uh, AI. I use Copilot, not not GPT, but Copilot. Yeah, um, it's quite good. And then even for like my marketing work, similarly, you know, I'll write gibberish like in terms of like here's all my random ideas and then i'll ask ai to like summarize it and then make it better so then i can like communicate it easier to the team or to people i'm working with like, so there, there's some like incremental value uh basically it's like having an assistant that's maybe somewhat smart but in, like it it's it's dumb in some ways but it's quite smart in some ways so you can sort of leverage the smart parts of it um but yeah who knows in, in five years it, it's going to be different stuff, man. i, I I have an eight-year-old daughter and like, so I asked my angel, I said, hey, if you were to deploy a site today, what would you do? He's like, you know, next Cloudflare, you know, he's like, I'll do Cloudflare, I'll do this. So I was like, okay, can you send it to me in Slack? And then I sent it over to, to ChatGPT and I said, explain this to me like I'm eight years old, my daughter is eight, and give me a step-by-step -step guide. So I sent it to her like on this Notion doc. <laughs> and dude, literally a day later, my daughter has built like a full website using Tailwinds, like this whole thing. She's eight, dude, no eight way. years old. I'll send you That's the link. That's amazing. Yeah. yeah. We deployed it and everything yeah. into production. She did all that. And eight years old, man. And all of that, she, I, I like, I looked at her chat log with, with uh, chat GPT. She's asking these questions. Well, how do I do this with this? And I'm like, that's the difference is that, like you have maybe like you have like engineers who can get like 20%, 30% better. But then there's people who like my daughter, who's eight, who just deployed a full, like full, full website on GitHub using, you know, it's, it's insane, dude. Like, so cool. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm finding it at times hard not to be scared, but it's exciting at the same time, which is interesting. It's like an int weird space to be in of like fear and excitement all in one. Um, but so far, I, I tend to yeah. fall on the excitement side of this. I, I think there'll be like a pendulum, right? It's like artificial anything. Uh, actually, I don't want to say that because they'll like listen to this later on and <laughs> come after me. <laughs> I'm just kidding. You know, I'm like, you guys are amazing. I love you all. Like, you know, they, my, me and my family are very supportive of you. Oh, <laughs> uh, no. Uh, I, I think that like realness is going to prevail and like uh, the opposite of artificial will always prevail. And there are, uh, there's going to be a world that like that, that makes a lot of sense as well. So, uh, leverage it today the best I can. I'm really excited about the technology. I'm trying to build side projects in it today. I love it very much. I have like literally six ideas that I'm like, like just wish I had more time in the day. Cause I have like their dope, but, uh, I actually don't have that kind of time right now, <laughs> but you know, uh, that's awesome. Well, we'll see how the future is. Cam, well, thank you for speculating a little bit with me. Uh, I really appreciate the time. Uh, I'm quite grateful for our conversation and um, I'm excited to see Pipe grow even further. I think you guys are providing a really great tool to founders. Um, as I mentioned, we have you work with some of your customers and uh, you obviously have built a really great team who's been able to scale the company up. And I'm just excited to just observe you do more of here and um, see Pipe go to the moon. Oh, thank you. And I really appreciate you having me on. I, I love the jam on any of those topics ever again. So if you want to talk about, if we want to really go deep dive on that Bitcoin <laughs> or why my yeah. thesis of crypto, like I'll get the soapbox out and we can, uh, we can get there. We can, yeah, we can get there, but yeah. And, and, and I really appreciate everything you do. Uh, and you have the best day. All right. You too. Thank you so much. All right. And that's a wrap. I uh, really appreciate Cam for joining us on the pod today. 
and I hope you enjoyed listening and, and learning from him like I did. Uh, it, was, it was wonderful to get to really speak to someone who's quite genuine about his abilities and, and sort of where he, sh- he shines in the organization and, and why he's, he's joined Pipe and have such a rock conversation about the different approaches he's taken in the past and ha- how he sort of thinks about managing his team. And as always, if you're interested in this podcast, please subscribe and uh, follow us wherever you're listening to this or email me if you have <laughs> advice or suggestions on how we can do this better. All right. Hope to see you on the next one, folks. Thank you so much for listening.